Hey, Jody here. Today I'm stick welding with some pretty big 7018s. I've been thinking about my very first welding job lately. I was still in welding school. I'd only been in school for maybe four months, five months, something like that. And the instructor says, hey, they're hiring over here at this, uh, at this shop and they need some MIG welders and stick welders. And I know we're only going to be on winter break for a month or so. Don't tell them you're only going to be there a month. Don't worry. Most people will only be there a month. And that's what I found out. When I got there, it was very much like that. It was a sweatshop. And so <laughs> the, the, test, the, test that, the test that they wanted to give me was a MIG welding T-joint. The guy just says, hey, weld me a T-joint here. Had everything all set up. I think it was about 3 eighths thick. I pulled the trigger on that MIG gun. And all I had ever done in school so far was short circuit MIG. That's just a little bit of that. It was mostly stick. I pulled the trigger on that MIG gun, and it was so hot. It was, it was set up for spray. I didn't know what spray was at the time. So green, so new. And I had pulled the trigger on it. It was just about to drive that, after about a half inch, it was about to drive that wire through the back side. And so I just triggered it all the way up. It actually looked pretty good. And he comes over and he says, you want that uphill? I said, yeah. He said, I didn't think it could be done uphill. But anyway, we need, some, we need a MIG welder and we need a stick welder. And I said, I'll be the stick welder because I knew right away I didn't know anything about MIG. Uh, I didn't know near as much about MIG as I thought I did. So, so the job was uh, welding a mast head support on a, on a mobile drilling rig. It was high strength steel and it, we used 3 16 diameter 110 18s. And it, it, the, the job involved basically there was a guy tacking and stacking. You know, he was just tacking with a MIG gun. And then he would stack them over here for me to weld out. And I had like an electric hoist and position them. Everything was done flat and horizontal. But I burnt those stick rods for 10 hours a day, sitting on a bucket. And 10 hour, when I say 10 hours, I mean just about 10 hours a day. Because if you go get a drink of water, this was one of those jobs where if you, if you go get a drink of water, somebody would be like, uh, what, what's up? It's not break time. You know? <laughs> and it was that kind of job. So, you know... It's a, it was a crappy job, but I knew it was only for a month or so. I knew I would learn something, and I knew I would get some experience. And some experience is way better than no experience. So I say all that to say this. This is sort of geared towards students or people starting out. Don't be afraid to take that crappy job, that seemingly crappy job right out of the gate. You're going to learn something even after four or five months under my belt. I didn't know anything, but I could burn a rod. And that's really what they needed is somebody to burn a rod. So I learned, I learned to watch my arc strikes. I learned how to make tie-ins. I learned a little bit, a little something about, you know, the, the effects that paint had and how it's, you know, the old guy, they called him dad. Uh, he came over and, you know, put me under his wing a time or two. He said, you know, like, a lot of people think that paint will hide these defects, but a lot of times paint will actually bring them out. So you don't want any undercut. We can't have any spatter. You got to clean these welds. And so it taught me something, you know. I never forget it to this day, and that was, <laughs> that was a while ago. Very good experience. I, I got to be a member of the Black Booger Club during that during that month. And so anyway, this video, in this video, I'm burning 3 16th 7018s. And I'm, I'm going to do a multi-pass weld, uh, roughly a three-quarter inch fillet. I didn't have my fillet gauge for this video. Uh, multi-pass weld, and I'm going to be thinking about this first job I had while I'm doing it. And I'm going to try to provide as much advice and tips for those getting started out as I possibly can. There should be something for everybody here. Let's do it. All right, today we're using the ESOB Rebel 285. This is a multi-process machine. Uh, I've done two other videos using it. One, the first one comparing dual shield flux core to short circuit MIG, both of them vertical uphill T-joints, just to kind of compare speed, rate of deposition, and things like that, and also techniques. And I talked about how with short circuit MIG, you kind of have to do kind of a technique to keep the arc in front of the puddle in order to make it lay down flat, whereas with dual shield, you don't have to do much. I also did a video, vertical uphill stick welding a T-joint, a two-pass stick weld with 1 8 7018s, and kind of compared that to dual shield as far as speed goes. And obviously, it was much slower than the dual shield, but still good. So for today's video, though, we're going to do a multi-pass, one-inch thick plate steel lap joint. And I'm going to start off at 200 amps. This machine's got a feature called Arc Force as well as Hot Start. Hot Start really helps you keep from sticking rods. And the Arc Force just kind of helps you dial the arc in depending on what kind of rod you're using. So I've got them both set on 20 today for this particular uh, video. I'm not going to 
mess with them a whole lot. I just figured 20 would be a good all-around settings for 7018. Again, this is one inch thick plate. I'm not going to mess with it. It's hot rolled. And the reason I'm not going to mess with it is because that first job that I had, nothing was cleaned. It was all just strictly hot rolled steel, probably why they used stick on it. Ooh, 200 is plenty for that, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I grabbed a 1 8 rod for the tack wells and I forgot that I had it set on 200. Plus I had the hot start on, so that was a lot of amps for a 1 8 rod and it really made a lot of spatter and a lot of BB. So I set it back down to about 130 for the tacks. And 130 is about right for a 1 8 rod, which is a kind of a good a good principle is to use a smaller rod for your tack welds and then to come across it with a bigger rod. Here's a 3 16 compared to a 1 8. You can see how much bigger it is. It's a pretty big rod. They make them bigger, but 3 16 is a pretty good size. A lot easier to weld flat and horizontal than it is vertical uphill or overhead with it, that's for sure. So I'm going to weld one pass, then two passes, and then stack three over that. And I'm going to speed a lot of this up today because you can see how slowly it's moving here. So now I'm speeding it up, and the benefit of that is you can kind of see the hand positioning, how it changes as the rod burns off. I'm going to use lots of different, lots of different hand positioning today. Check out that wooden handle chip and hammer. See, it's got a, a, a burnt area on it. It's charred. It's been through a house fire. It was in my toolbox, the side of the toolbox got scorched, but it's still okay. It still works. It was a payroll deduct from that first crappy job that I got. A new design chip and hammer is this. It's called a scrape and burr, and I stopped by the Fabtech booth and checked this out. My buddy JD bought this and, and one other also. It's got a hardened uh, replaceable uh, bit there, and it's really, really good for scraping BBs, spatter, and stuff like that, and they actually make one that's radius, too, for handrails and things so you know maybe it's a little bit of an improvement on the old unchanged chipping hammer I'm going to give it a try out today scraping and brushing all right that was 200 amps and I'm going to show in a minute a, a restart here a tie-in right there at that crater I'm going to try to light up ahead of it try to keep my arc strikes where I weld back over them I'm going to try to make it seem like you can't tell where the restart was what I can tell right here is 200 amps is maybe not quite enough. The way that, that flux is just kind of swirling around there in the puddle for a minute. It's a little bit cold. It's, it's hot enough. It's within scope of the, of the range of the rod. But for a, for a thick metal like this, fillet weld, I'm going to bump it up a little bit. Let's see if I can't make things look a little bit better. If you bump it up too much, it runs good, but it, you start getting arc blow at the end of it. All right, these are low hydrogen rods, so I'm keeping them in a portable rod caddy here. It keeps them up good and hot. That, that job that I had, by the way, there was no rod caddies. They just, you just had a 50-pound can. You opened it with a grinder, used it for your rod stub can, et cetera. Even though there are 11018s, they didn't worry too much about keeping them warm during the day. So I bumped it up to 220 now. Let's talk a little bit about different hand positioning. I use this method a lot, like a pinky to thumb type collapse. I just kind of can relax this way and change angles a lot. I do a lot of different ways. Sometimes I just hold it with one hand. Coming around a corner like this, you know, you gotta, you gotta plan ahead a little bit and change rod direction, twist your wrist maybe sometimes, and making a dry run or two kind of helps settle in your mind what you're gonna do when you get there. After a while, you don't even have to think about it too much, but I'm trying to give as much advice to beginners as I can, folks in welding school that are, you know, going to weld around a corner like this on their first job. You might not even do anything like this in welding school. You do a whole lot of straight runs, plates, practice plates, test plates. Oftentimes, you don't get to build a whole lot or weld odd angles and stuff, so it's good to get a little bit of that under your belt before you get that first job. So I've got this sped up four times here. It's, it's amazing to me how slowly this thing runs. Uh, when you're when you're under the helmet, it doesn't you don't really notice it, but when you're watching it, man, slow. That is how they wanted us to burn the rods down. That or more, you get yelled at if you didn't burn them down to a nub like that. They were really conscientious about waste. I bought a 10-pound box of these rods. These are not ESOB rods, by the way. I just didn't have any 3 16 diameter rods, so I bought a, a sort of a store brand, uh, 10 pounds, vacuum sealed, 
they seem to be doing okay. I've definitely run better rods. All right, let's take a look at another restart here. Things are going a little bit better, I think, now that I cranked it up a little bit. What we want to do is light up ahead, straight ahead, keep the arc strikes where you're going to weld back over them. Light up and then take that first ripple right into that crater and try not to leave any any of that crater. Try to try to make it so you can't tell that there was a tie in there. That's the goal. You don't want to overlap it more than in that crater. Or if you do, you don't want to overlap it much. A little hump is not going to be the end of the world. I'm going to try to take it right there. Now I can see that I had a little BB there that I went back over. And it'll probably show up in the toe of the weld there. We'll see. Not too bad. Now for the second pass, you know, the first pass I used this type of a rod angle. Pretty much a 45 or maybe even heading toward the bottom plate a little bit more. But for that second pass, I'm mainly concerned about undercut up on the top member. So I'm going to angle the rod sort of like this to prevent undercut. I've got my fume extractor going here. You see my rod angle, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing a lot more into that upper member and I'm watching that toe of the weld. I'm watching that top edge of the weld so that I don't get undercut. As I mentioned before, when something's gonna be painted, sometimes it, the paint really does bring the undercut out, makes it obvious. Not to mention the fact that it's just, a, it's a flaw. There are limits to how much undercut you can have within welding codes. Usually it's fairly strict, like a 32nd of an inch or less. All right, that's what happens when you burn a rod. A 7018 rod usually burns up inside that flux and it doesn't restart good at all. So you can take your glove and kind of crumble that off. Uh, sometimes that works okay in a pinch, but I like to keep a rough file on hand and I like to just really quickly make them almost like a new one. A bare tip that starts really easily and it's got immediate flux coverage without having to burn off a quarter inch of bare rod with hardly any flux on it. So here's another tie in and we'll go around this corner here. changing that rod angle. I'm really not trying to whip or anything like that. That's just me shaking a little bit as I'm changing angles. I'm going to do another quick restart here. If you can grab a rod and get right back in that puddle within seconds of terminating the arc, things will melt together a whole lot better. You know, the hotter that metal is, the better restart you have. So, you know, you don't want to you don't want to stop, go get a drink of water and then restart in other words restarting a bead immediately after you terminate just grab a rod and get right back in there you get a better restart that way keeping a, a fairly tight arc and watching the top of that weld so that I don't get undercut that's what I'm doing right here probably better to wrap those corners and have the restarts not on the corners but in this case I just ran a, at a rod right on the corner I grabbed another rod right away I got right back in there it's going to make a nice good restart with no cold shuts or anything like that. Not the end of the world. Just probably not the best idea to have all your stops and starts on the ends or on the corners. So I tried to stagger them for the most part. Well, that's two beads on there. That's one bead for a root and then two beads stacked over that. Things are, things are going okay, I suppose. I'm kind of getting my hand back in it. It's been a long time since I've done this kind of stuff. See, I've got one, one area right there where there was a big spatter BB that happened right on the restart, and it's showing up. I would kind of probably, probably grind that off, but I'm going to just uh, come across this with three more passes. I'm just going to leave it and weld over it. I am going to bump my amperage up again, though. I'm going up to 230 now. 2.30 is time to go to the dentist. Get it? Tooth hurty? Oh, dad joke. All right, this is the Aesop Sentinel A50 helmet. Uh, got this courtesy of Aesop for doing a talk at, at uh, Fabtech for them. You can see I got my 250 cheater in there. I'm not a young man anymore. I'm bumping up, I'm bumping up my uh, shade to 12 here. As I go higher in amperage, it's getting bright. So it's going to take a number 12 for me to feel comfortable here. 
Okay. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to run all this end for the sake of just getting something done here and getting about my business. I'm going to go ahead and run this all three passes on the end here so that I can get the arc shots done. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to center up on the toe of the weld. That's the edge of the weld on the bottom. I'm trying to center up on that. Use that as my center line for a guide. Then I'm trying to center up on the top edge of that weld. And also I keep an eye on that, that top of the other weld there. It's kind of a guide to keep me going. You kind of, when you're welding like this, you're, you're moving your eyes around, looking at different things for hash marks, kind of keep you going just like lines on a road to keep you in the middle of the, of the lane. You kind of keep an eye on those things. And then the third bead, I'm just centering up on it, on the line of, of the edge of the weld and really, really, really watching the top of that puddle keeping a tight arc and going slow enough to lot not to leave any undercut so that's three passes and I'm burning I'm making them all on the end here again just for time's sake so I can get those arc shots done without having to reset the camera a hundred times let's clean this up and get a little quick look at it here a fellow named named Rick Bishop he's Rick's got it on Instagram sent me and JD uh, some of these flashlights here and they are awesome it's got like a little lantern feature as well as a directional light slide is the name you know you just press the button you get the directional you press it a couple more times you get the lantern and I've dropped mine like a hundred times on the shop floor it's still working just fine awesome awesome flashlight now this is a multi-pass weld that first job that I had they were all single pass fillet welds but while I'm welding the rest of this out I got it in super super fast motion here it just reminds me of how this came into play, how being able to run these big rods came into play, even as a pipe welder or pipe fitter. You know, I predominantly welded pipe, but there were certain times on jobs when the pipe systems might be finished and you had to weld pipe supports. And it would be just like this. A lot of heavy wide flange welded onto embedded uh, steel in concrete, pass after pass after pass, having to avoid undercut, get it inspected afterwards, bought off on a visual and, and all that. So you never know what job you have is preparing you for another job. Like I thought that job was the crappiest job ever and I did for years and then but looking back on it now I can understand how you know I really wasn't worth much. I wasn't worth much more than they were paying me and it was free training and I was getting paid and it helped me later on for higher paying jobs. Well, stay tuned for more videos using this machine as well as the 215. I uh, have not tested the Lift Arc TIG yet on it, but I do have some pipe stuff coming up pretty soon. JD's got a job where we'll do some open root pipe as well as some dual shield flux core fill and uh, whatever else we can think of. So appreciate you watching and we'll see you next time.